be uh, at our college when you think about our core values around access, workforce development, and social mobility, and then you look at all the sessions that are going to be in this conference, you see their embedded growth. So there's great alignment between what our core mission is and what this group believes in. So uh, it, it's an honor, it's a privilege, and uh, we welcome you to our campus and, and hope next year we can do this all over again. And I want to make a bold statement, but it is one that can be only justified with careful examination of the current trajectory of economic, geopolitical, and technological trends. It is my assertion that the work that this group does, preparing our future workforce in the skilled trades, the specialized training and service repair design will be the most consequential in our future. And it was 70 years ago today, 70 years ago, economist Joseph Schopner used a seemingly poetic description to explain the free market's means for delivering progress. And he said, Capital capitalism drives economic development like a perennial gale of creative destruction. So creative destruction, that revolutionary force that delivers benefits, the benefits of an automobile, the benefits of a word processor or a digital camera, can a digital camera at the expense of the horse and buggy, the typewriter and the Polaroid. To the unprepared, the dizzying velocity of today's change can bring as much disruption as it does long-term benefits. But if we are going to harness the energy and the opportunities of these transformative forces, we will need a workforce that can excel in mastering, integrating, and managing the new innovative technologies in both products and processes. So getting this right has implications that range from economic prosperity and national security. So while we have a strong sense of where we need to go, it's also worth recognizing what failure looks like. So I'd like to do a little bit about what's happening with CTE right now. Uh, uh, I know many of you are aware of Perkins was reallocated under Perkins 5, and a number of you have signed up for the workshops tomorrow to find out what some of the exciting changes are, uh, not the least of which is our ability to reach down to the middle schools. And so we are going to be doing a lot of planning in the next couple of years of how we can reach down to the middle schools to uh, uh, really attract those students to our program so when they come up to the high school, they already are knowledgeable of what's going on. Uh, page three of your program has a number of upcoming events over the next few months. Uh, and there is one recent addition. Uh, this coming November, there will be a culinary competition being held in Nashua. Uh, and it's in partnership with the National Guard, where the secret ingredient will be MREs. For those of you who are not aware, that is the meal ready to eat for the military. Uh, so each of the, the we, I believe we have four teams right now, yes? Somebody from Nashville, we have four. We were hoping for six, we have four teams, three student teams. Each team will have a National Guard uh, representative on the team with them to help guide them a little bit of what flavor you should or should not use with an MRE. Uh, and then uh, I believe the Jay Roxy from Nashville will be the uh, judges for the competition. And we do have a special guest MC, uh, Douglas Phillips, who was last year's holiday making champion from the Food Network, uh, will be our guest MC for the event. So we're really excited about uh, that one coming up in November. Uh, and the next big piece uh, that I can announce because it has made it through government council uh, is we will be investing in a mobile CTE classroom that over the course of the next several years will be taking around state to promote CTE not only at the high schools but the middle schools and within the community. Uh, and where are my graphic design teachers? Graphic design teachers, we've got a couple of them. We are hoping to have a competition with all of you and your classes to design the outside of our RV, which we're going to be converting into a mobile classroom. So I'm going to touch base with you a little bit later today when you're in your group, but we'll be getting some more information out to you. We'd love to have a statewide competition for your students to design what the outside of this mobile classroom looks like. I want to talk about two goals for NHDAP-CTE. And uh, uh, first,
first is so interesting. We uh, mentioned a year ago or so that we're really starting a new organization. And when you hear the word NH-CTE, uh, that is in contrast to NH-CTA. NH-CTE is an organization uh, for everyone, so anybody who should create technical education. Um, and so we did a survey uh, this spring of teachers who create technical education, and there were about 218 responses, which is a good number, it's about two-thirds of all teachers. And we asked four questions about NH-CTE. The first was, are you interested in helping create a new organization? And out of those 218, 102 of them said, I am very interested in being part of starting a new organization. I thought that was pretty cool. And we said, what's your focus group? And in that case, 104 said, it could be the same roughly, because they're interested in focus group. Then we asked, how many people are interested in joining a new group? At that point, we got 174 responses out of 218 saying, I want to be part of it. And the last one is, I would like to be, uh, I don't know, whatever I get in my handwriting. I, I, I'd like to be uh, informed uh, regularly about the growth of this group. And we got 185 responses saying, very affirmative, I want to do it. So I say this story just to get you to reflect a little bit. Uh, we are not at present an organized group. We do not have a structure. Uh, just in case you want to take a look at your wallet right now, I can, I can assure you there's not a single person in this room who has an NH-CTE membership card in their wallet, because it doesn't exist. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next stretch of time where we're at a conference next year, possibly, and I say, open your wallet up, and everyone in this room has that card. What does that card mean? It means I'm part of something. And I think you are, know that you're part of something, and I want to credit Eric and his staff for pulling this together, that this makes us part of something. The last thing I want to tell you is the news has been dominated by uh, Learn Everywhere and Career Academies, and I'm sure you've read the papers, you know about it. I just want to remind you, and I want you to hear this loud and clear, that career technical education is the choice program in the state of Hampshire. We service about 9,000 students. Presently, Learn Everywhere services zero students. And it's important that you reflect when you read the news and you try to sort out where you stand, that Learn Everywhere has its merits. Career Academy has its merits. I'm not commenting negatively on those. But I don't want you to lose track of the fact that, as I say to all our assemblies, we have 660 kids at CRTC, we're talking to them. You chose us. Not one person in that room has to be there. And I want to remind you in this audience of career technical education teachers that that is our formula. You're darn good at it. And when you get discouraged and you're trying to figure out where you stand in the world, don't forget that piece of the puzzle. You are different than the algebra teacher and the U.S. history teacher and the chemistry teacher who is in a classroom filled with students who have to be there. Everything you do is predicated on, I have a value proposition. And the value proposition I have is something I'm going to give you of value. And you know what? Nobody's signing up if it doesn't have value. So I want you in the next two days to hear from both days or just today. Keep that in your brain, that you are doing a great job, you do something very important, and it's different than the rest of education. Two major initiatives that we launched this year, and I am proud of the academic leadership of our administrative team and our faculty and the staff that have made this possible. One is that we will open our campus this fall as a true and open partner with the community college system of New Hampshire. It's different in that it's not just an articulation. We are saying, please join us, reduce your costs by using our facilities during the times that they're not in use by us because our schedules are complementary. Help us think with our four-year degree credentials about the two-year offerings that our community college system has authority and responsibility to deliver about new credentials that we can unbundle and offer to the public of this state. And so we'll welcome River Valley as the first full program to our college in the coming weeks. And over the next few years, we'll be talking about new programs we can build, ways for us to be a true and full partner with the community college system, and open pathways of access and affordability. This is big, and it means a lot, and it's only because we have a tremendous number of people on both sides of those systems working very hard to make this happen. But it's for the right reasons. The second thing, and what's so important for me to um, talk a little bit about today is that with the leadership of Dean Carey College, we already had way for again earlier, working with Lynn Arnold from our continuing education team over in the back corner, waving great, you have to stand up maybe on the table then just so folks can see you. Um, Lynn Arnold and Mike Welsh, our assistant dean, um, who works with Carey. 
These three individuals, with many of you and the leaders at your institutions, have crafted partnership agreements between King State College and the majority, not all, we have four left, as I understand it, 24 of the 28 career and technical ed centers in this state have signed an agreement with King State. And what that agreement commits is that your students, if they choose to come to us to pursue a four-year degree, will be granted eight credits from the curriculum they experienced at your institutions when they come to us. This accelerates them. We have, again, because of Dean College's leadership, a degree in three pathway for 19 of our academic programs. When we start bundling up these options, Keene State becomes an increasingly cost-effective way for students to have an incredibly broad-based liberal arts grad in education, but in a way that they can move quickly into the workforce. And what this means, oh, thank you. <laughs> what this means is it's lower price, and that also, more importantly to me, is this is my promise to you, that we value what you do, and we understand it's equivalent. We have mapped it. That is the work that Lynn has done and our faculty have done to honor the work and the educational experiences you offer your student is equivalent in the cases of those credits that we're bringing in. And that is important because we value what you do and we value the learning that your students would come to us with. This matters to me and it matters to Keene State. And I just want you to know that, that we mean that. This relationship is real and that it values the work you do and we know that your students can be successful at Keene State. Artisans. So let's talk about artisans. I've always enjoyed that word, which means uh, a worker in a skilled trade, especially one that involves making things by hand. And to me, uh, an artisan brings a certain beauty and refinement to uh, a hands-on mechanical trade like auto technicians. And of course, the artisans of old were, went through apprenticeship programs that took years uh, to develop them, working one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, with a master before they became a, a master themselves. And today, I think we have a much better model, which is a career in technical education. And I love that model up there, IACTE, uh, because you all do fantastic things uh, for all the industry uh, that's out there. So let me jump back about 20 or 25 years ago. I wasn't here in the state, but my understanding is that uh, there was a much more acute uh, auto tech shortage uh, for the automotive business the point where they were reaching out uh, up into Canada and down into Texas, in Texas to recruit their steel technicians uh, into their shops. But it just wasn't a model that wasn't working well. Uh, the New Hampshire winters don't work so well for somebody coming from Texas. So they decided to build a better model, which was really to, to grow their own. And began the process to become heavily involved in New Hampshire Community College, and more importantly, the local career and tech guys centers here. So the key to the success of growing your own is an inter interdependent relationship between the CTE centers and the industry. The CTE centers, they can teach a subject matter, but within a limited amount of time, especially in the mantra that we have here, 90 minutes, it's not enough to apply those skills for the students. And so that's where the industry comes in, where the students have a chance through their job shadow, through their internships, to apply those skills and implement those skills. But the shops don't have the time, the time to teach and a methodical, thorough way the skills that they need. So turning to the CT centers about 20 years ago, first goal for us as an association was, let's try and create a national certification. And today we have over 20 schools that are nationally certified under ASE, which is a huge accomplishment uh, for the schools themselves. And it takes a lot of work and effort to get certified and to continue to be uh, certified. And in the past two years, we've turned our focus filling that pipeline because we have 20 high schools with auto tech. We have five fantastic community colleges with auto tech, but we need to fill that pipeline. And so to us, the evidence is clear. Most successful technician is one, uh, or a student is one that regularly apply their skills at local businesses and work with a mentor. The most successful shops are the ones who provide internships, job sharing, provide tools, provide equipment, participate in schools, advisory boards who provide advice as to the latest technology and its resources for the schools and the students. And finally, the schools are the most successful work closely with the local businesses. They visit them, they reach out to them, they make phone calls, they get to know them well, uh, and they have open communications 
see their places more than just sending out an email to try and get them to sit down and buy a report, but had that relationship. So the partnership for us uh, facilitates job shadowing, part time, full time, work time, uh, I'm sorry, part time, full time work opportunities. Uh, we give away $70,000 a year in scholarship for students attending community colleges. Uh, we have tool and equipment donations to the local high school programs. Uh, we've created an auto tech uh, career college day for our high school students in the industry and community colleges to come together and talk about careers in auto tech. We created a statewide hands on written auto tech competition with winners and winners of the national competition. But it's still, it still has not been, it's still it's not an easy process. It takes a lot of time, money, money and energy, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, it means holding the schools and teachers in the S industry accountable when they're not holding up their end of the bargain. Shops that say to me now, Pete, I can't find a technician. I need help finding a technician. And I've learned now to turn it right back around and say, well, what have you done to build your own technician? Are you mentoring high school or college students? Do you sit on advisory boards with your CTD center? And similarly, some uh, teachers will say to us, I can't find people to sit on my advisory board. And I can turn that right around and say, hey, you have gone out and reached and sat down with the local industry, be it auto tech or be it any other uh, industry that's out there. And have them sit on your advisory board and build up that relationship. So going forward, we're also looking at other needs of the auto industry beyond the technical end of it. We need other artisans in the sales and the business end of it, uh, and the parts service managers end of it. We believe that similar opportunities exist between industry and the CTE centers, much like we have on the auto tech. So in short, if we want artisans, and we all need artisans, not just auto tech, but in, in every career that's out there, we need to ensure that the schools and industry work together. A partnership is the key state mentioned partnership together with the CTD centers. So I just want to say thank you, because you're artisans and you're in and of yourself. Thank you for building the artisans in the future uh, for the auto, as well as the other industries. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you very much. One of the first things I learned as a teacher at Dover High was that students learn differently. I know all of you know that. Um, and that for many students, hands-on learning, the opportunity to participate, to connect what they're doing in the classroom with the real world and what their life is going to be outside of school is really critical. And I think that's what CTE education helps students do partnership that you have with the private sector, with businesses, is very impressive and a real model that we should look to um, export as we're talking about what we need to do across the country. So I'm a member of the Senate Small Business Committee, and in that capacity I've had the opportunity to visit a lot of the small businesses across the state and hear from them some of the challenges that they're facing. Of course, I know all of you know that we have a very robust economy in New Hampshire right now. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country, but that's a double-edged sword. And for probably the most often heard comment I get as I travel around the state is, we can't find the workers that we need. And so to be able to cite some of the really exciting partnerships that are going on as an example of how we get young people both interested in different career opportunities and recognizing what they can do if they stay in New Hampshire. As you all know, one of the big challenges we have in the state is that so many of our young people um, graduate from high school, they go out of state to college, they go out of state to work, and they don't come back. And so this is one way to ensure that young people understand what opportunities exist for them and what they can do when they graduate. I was meeting with some folks from Raytheon. I'm also on the Armed Services Committee, and so I um, talk to folks at Raytheon pretty regularly, and we have a, a lot of New Hampshire folks who go down to Massachusetts to work for their plan, and they were lamenting the fact that they can't find skilled workers. And so I was citing to them some of the programs, some of the partnerships that we have here that have been so successful. Um, like Wayland Engineering over the um, Connecticut River Valley where they've done such a great job of working with the, the high school and 
with the superintendent of schools there who really helped, you all really helped design that program and getting young people to understand what opportunities they have if they get that internship. And so I think we've got some, some excellent examples that we can build on and we should be doing that in terms of our successes. And if we're going to continue to sustain this high-skill economy, we need to align the skills that are required by, by businesses with the education and the skills that young people are learning as they're going through um, high school and through technical education. A very young person going into a very professional field, it's very shocking um, and intimidating. But once I took that out of consideration, I was like, I know what I'm doing because I've been through these programs that I've been through learning all of these softwares that are kind of mind-blowing at first, but basically um, the internship versus classroom experience really made a difference because I learned in the internship the different programs that they use, but also that through CTE, all you know, design and components have a very similar base, like you, you draw a line, you draw a circle, you know, those types of things that you, when you get overwhelmed, you don't really realize that you can actually do it. Um, this internship program also helped me um, because I realized that I don't really want to be as a designer as I thought when I first started high school. Um, I was in the control lot. <laughs> that kind of got sad. And I wanted to be outside more and see what was going on in real life. Um, so that's one thing I've learned from an internship that I think is beneficial, it's beneficial to everybody. Even if you don't know what you want to do, just going out and trying it and seeing what it is, it's probably the best thing you can do. Because um, also this internship helped me network with that company and it helped me create connections I never knew I would ever have. Um, I got career advice. They gave me kind of like a rundown of what civil engineering is, brought me to concrete plants, all the whole nine yards, um, and also helped me connect through getting in LinkedIn, getting connected through um, other avenues for resume building and all those other sorts of things. So I want to talk to you about, of course, being a woman in construction real quick and maybe a little bit about what I hope for for future students. And then I also want to tell you about where it all started, what brought me here. And the truth of it is, when I was 11 years old, and I was in, in Manchester Middle School, and I was lucky enough to be assigned to a woodworking class one semester. And I absolutely loved it. I can't tell you everything I did in that class. I can't remember all of that, but I remember how excited I was to start my day there. And then I remember how excited I was and how much I wanted to be there after school. And then, of course, I also remember how Mr. LeBlanc just outright tortured us, right? That guy, for the whole first week of our class, made us write down all the rules of the wood shop. And like, when you're 11 and it takes a whole week to go through 21 rules, it's like straight up torture. And, and then the worst part was, you know what he did? Right after we finished writing, immediately after we finished writing all those rules down? He handed us a piece of paper typed out that had all 21 rules on it. 11-year-old me is like, well, very upset. Like, we could have skipped all this. But I know, I understand what he was trying to do, right? Like, he's trying to get us to remember all the rules. But here's the thing, I only remember the first rule of Mr. LeBlanc's woodshop. Anybody want to take a guess? Use common sense. That is the first rule of woodshop. Use common sense. And I still think it's a pretty great rule, and I still remember it to this day. All right, and then from all it was, from there, all it was in high school was somebody going, hey, Stephanie, do you want to build houses? And I was like, heck yeah, I do. I had no idea, like, what I'd be doing, but it was a pretty cool idea to learn. About building houses um, 
and again, I don't remember everything I did there, but I remember all the um, things it gave me, right? Uh, confidence and empowerment for one thing, right? Like it was so empowering to realize that I could do this. Like I can build things, I can put things together. This is awesome. And then it gave me the confidence to be like, hey, this is my thing. I'm gonna own it, I'm gonna do it. And it also gave me a couple of my best friends. So this is Steve and I, we thought we were so cool, we just got our OSHA 10, and we're all harnessed up and ready to get to work. So cool. Um, so I met him intro uh, to woodworking. Then we did carpentry all three years, uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year. And then we went to Wentworth and Stoop Technology, both majoring in construction management. And now we do the exact same thing for two different companies in Boston. And it's just really great to be working with your best friend, even if you are competitors. <laughs> oh, wow. um, and another thing my carpentry class gave me was my first real job in construction. I talk about it a lot, I probably bore people, but um, I actually got to work with a cabinetry and mill workshop because my teacher went up to the owner who was on our advisory board and said, hey, she needs a job, can you give her one? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what he said? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure, just come on down. And it was great because I learned so much from there, right? Like I've gotten the idea of like working hard and like it's okay to like actually uh, work hard for you know a living. But then in the wood shop, that's where I really learned to work hard, right? Working there at 5.30 in the morning, picking up, picking things up and putting them down. I went from pushing a broom around to assembling cabinets to running their CNC machine that cuts all of the pieces for their cabinets, their subframes, the countertops. So it's like the heart and soul of this company. One wrong move and I can put them out of business for a week. <laughs> um, and it's all because of this guy right here. This is Tom. Uh, he's my partner in the wood shop and he's one of the very first people to say, guys, this chick's got a brain. <laughs> we gotta use it. <laughs> so um, he taught me just about everything I know about cabinet making. Um, and he also, not only is my work partner, but he became my mentor, my close confidant, and one of my best friends. 